Good afternoon and welcome to you wherever you are. My name is Adrian Turpin. I'm the uh, Artistic Director of the Wigtown Book Festival, uh, who are the team behind Big Bang Week. And this is our very first event, Big Bang Week 2022. Um, this festival, I have to say, is inspired by the dark skies of southwest Scotland, um, and particularly by the fact that neighbouring us in Scotland's National Book Town is the International Dark Skies of the Galloway Forest, International Dark Skies Park. But we hope we've got a much greater reach than that. We hope that we're going to be bringing people in from all over the world for our events through to Saturday. And I'm really delighted today to be kicking off this um, this festival with Professor Emily Levesque of the University of Washington um, and her wonderful book, um, The Last Stargazers. Um, this is such a great book. It's a book about astronomers, but it's probably a book about astronomers that you've, like you've never read before. It's not a book about Kepler. It's not a book about Galileo. It's not even a book about Vera Rubin, although she does come into it at one point. It's a book about the daily life of today's astronomers and potentially at a time when the world is changing, when technology is changing, and the need to be going out up mountains, uh, staying up all night, is, is disappearing under, under the, the changes that are coming through technology. It's a wonderful, humane, delightful, and very funny book, and I'd like to introduce Emily Lewis. Hi. <laughs> Hi, Emily. Um, we've got so much to get through. I, I'm, I'm just going to go straight in and just ask you, so astronomy, uh, career or a calling? Career or calling? Um, I think it's a calling that needs to become a career um, for those of us who do it full time. Um, I, I talk in the book about how all of us have some level of curiosity about the night sky. Um, I think a lot of us have lots of big questions about the natural world, but only some of us wind up deciding this is going to be our permanent jobs. So I think for myself and a lot of my colleagues, we were drawn to astronomy and we were drawn to the mysteries of space from a very young age or through exposure by teachers or by dark sky sites and wonderful stargazing. And then it was just a matter of learning the ropes of how to make a, make a long-term professional career out of it. Uh, absolutely. And when we imagine astronomy, I mean, those of us who are not, not in the business, so to speak, we, we still kind of imagine, you imagine the kind of person with a tripod in a garden or a field somewhere looking at somewhere. And one of the things which is first thing to say about this book is, is that you learn pretty quickly that is not the case. You are dealing with some pretty big telescopes. Oh, yeah. It's and it's a it's a fair misunderstanding because you said those of us who aren't professional astronomers, there's only about 50,000 professional astronomers on the planet. And that's out of, you know, seven and a half billion people. So not only are most of us not astronomers, most of us haven't met a professional astronomer and gotten the chance to know what our job is like. So we think of it as a professional version of the stargazing a lot of us might have done in someone's backyard with a backyard telescope or at maybe a university open house or something like that. And the reality of it and how different the technology is, is something that I really found surprising and exciting when I started getting into the field professionally. Yeah, these big building sized telescopes built on remote mountaintops in the darkest corners of the planet, that they're building an operation as a whole profession in and of itself and learning how to use them is a huge part of the job. So you start the book, uh, well, you, having, having told us a little bit about yourself, you start the book by, by talking about your first experience of, of, um, of, of going out in the field in Arizona. And I think that's, I think it's a really good place to start because it just gives that sense of kind of, of, of you coming to the mountain for the first time and, and, and kind of, and some of those kind of, um, I don't know, not quite misapprehensions, but some of the things that we have, I think you, I get the feeling you had when you first, when, when you began, uh, when you were, when you were a grad student. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So my very first time at a professional observatory was at Kitt Peak National Observatory, which is in very southern Arizona. And the southwestern United States is one of the great spots on the planet for astronomy. And I was very lucky to get the chance to work there. But I remember driving down there with my research advisor thinking, I really don't know what I'm in for. You know, should how are we going to 
eat, or is there a cafeteria open in the middle of the night to feed us? When exactly do you sleep? Because you're obviously staying awake all night to do your work. Do you just learn how to sleep during the day? How am I supposed to help run this building sized telescope that I've had no training on? And that introduction to observing was wonderful. We were very lucky and we had five perfectly clear nights. We had no clouds. We had no technical problems. It was unusual. That's usually not the case in observing. And I got the chance to meet other astronomers who were there working and observing for the first time. And I remember sitting down with them that first night at dinner and the whole group immediately started telling me stories. And some stories were advice. They were things like, oh, remember to drink coffee, but stop drinking it at about 3 a.m. or you'll never get to sleep. And then they would say something like, you know, we have scorpions around here. We're in the middle of the, in the desert. So keep an eye on the floor. We had a woman who had a scorpion climb up the inside of her pant leg and sting her. And everybody kind of went and mm, picked their feet up off the floor. And then somebody else would say, remember to order the lunch that you eat in the middle of the night. And I know a guy who, you know, had, was in a telescope dome that got struck by lightning. And all of these stories went pinging around and I was so fascinated, but I realized that storytelling was how I was getting welcomed to the field and how they were showing me what I was in for. And years later, that's what wound up forming the basis of The Last Stargazers, was using those stories to give readers that sort of behind the scenes welcome of what the job is like. It's really clear from the, it's really clear from the book that, you know, there's, the way you start, there's a little bit of trepidation because you've got all this tech stuff. That can, and one of the things I really like is that you, you, you start off by talking about not just, uh, the book is very much not a historical book, but you do talk, you, you interview a lot of astronomers over, over a, a long period of time. A lot of, a lot of people who, I mean, you, there's one of your colleagues, one of your late colleagues who, 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 was, uh, who worked in, for 60 years in the field. And there are these brilliant stories about how, how it had changed and about the kind of, I suppose, the sheer kind of ricketiness um, in the old days of how things worked. And as you, I think you say at one point in the book that, you know, you spent all this money creating a kind of amazing telescope with an amazing huge mirror and yet not really think about where the actual astronomer comes comes into this. So, so and you came in after that, didn't you, rather? You, you, you're, 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 you're a slightly different generation, but, but how fun was it for you going back to, to, to talk to these sort of um, more vintage colleagues about, about I, I loved getting stories about how astronomy used to be done. And this was honestly one of my other main motivations for writing the book. I wanted to take people behind the scenes and show them what it's like to do astronomy. I wanted to put a human face on this kind of research. And I also wanted to write down some of these really incredible stories from a very unusual research field. So in the decades before we had digital cameras and digital imagers, we would actually capture pictures of the night sky on glass plates. Um, I actually have an example of one if people want to see just how flimsy and thin they are. I'm holding astronomical data in my hand. It's hard to see on the camera, but there's a picture of a star and its surrounding nebula on this piece of glass. And the process of getting glass that was chemically treated to darken when it was exposed to light, tailoring that glass to your observations, cutting it, doing all this work in the dark, because if you expose the glass to light, it would darken and it would become useless. And then wrangling it as you climbed into a telescope and sort of row it on board it. This is a very unusual and odd way to do research. And colleagues like uh, you mentioned my colleague, George Wallerstein, who, um, he observed for 30 years using photographic plates, and then he observed for 30 years using digital cameras. And he wasn't pining for the old days. Digital imaging has really been amazing for astronomy and it's enabled really great science. But some of his favorite memories were observing with glass plates and sitting sort of shivering in a telescope dome in the middle of the night and watching the stars spin by over your head and loading these glass sheets one at a time, waiting to find out what you had observed. So the romance of it was wonderful to capture along with the amazing technological evolution from almost sort of 19th century photographic technology, plates date back to the 1800s through to the amazing digital capabilities we have today. There's a brilliant story that you tell that these plates, so these plates are kind of made by Kodak or, or whoever, and, and none of them exactly fit the, uh, you know, they're all, they're all different sizes for, for, for essentially for different telescopes. And so you have to cut them into shape, which you obviously have to do in the dark. And, and mm -hmm. I, I, there's a brilliant story which you tell about one astronomer who 
who really just couldn't do this. So he just throws the plates on the floor and he picks up the biggest shard and sticks it in there, comes out, shows oh, yeah. his colleagues, and they say, hey, why, why is this all broken around the edges? So, uh, But it's full of lovely stories like that. Um, and, and, and also things like, you know, um, these sort of terrifying um, balancing acts of kind of climbing up to, you know, climbing up in, into the, into the, into the cage from which you, you you run the run the telescope, and is that something you've had to do personally still? No. So this so this idea of literally climbing into the telescope goes back to the days of photographic plates because astronomers would have to sit right next to the camera, and in a lot of telescopes of the day, the camera was suspended, you know, dozens of feet in the air over the telescope's mirror because light would come in, bounce off the mirror and then be reflected into the camera. So astronomers would ride up this like rickety old elevator on the side of a dome wall, or they would climb up a ladder or they would cross this like sort of wobbly board like dozens of feet in the air to get into the spot where they could sit. And I actually went to observatories and asked if any of them still had one of these setups so that I could find out what it was like because all of my observing has happened in the digital era and nobody even had that set up anymore. So again, this was a time of astronomy and a way of doing scientific research that I really wanted to capture because it's disappearing. Okay, so I'm gonna ask you some really quick questions because they're really obvious okay. questions. So, so um, on a night of observing, right? What do you do for eating? I mean, it's a long night. Your meals are all jumbled up, presumably. Yes. So we astronomers will usually order what they call night lunch from an observatory cafeteria if it has one. So you'll be given a sort of sack lunch to take up to the observatory with you. And you are supposed to eat that at around midnight. Most of us cave around 10 p.m. Um, and that's supposed to be your sort of extra meal to keep you going until the morning. Um, if you don't have a cafeteria, you tend to bring up a meal with you that you can microwave or heat up very quickly because you're working the whole time. Um, those of us in the know have learned to bring snacks. So goldfish crackers have propelled many of my observing runs. Um, but you basically just do what you can to eat and help yourself stay awake over the night. Well, that's the next question. It's like, how do you stay awake? And is, is there a kind of is there a dark night of the soul kind of moment or is, it, is, the, is the romance of the sky so great that you just carry on through? <laughs> so caffeine is usually judiciously applied <laughs> okay. and the excitement of being at a telescope does keep you going. You usually sit down and think, oh, this is amazing. I'm observing galaxies five billion light years away. How cool. And that excitement gets you to maybe 3 a.m. And after that, you just start looking at every flat surface going, I could sleep there and kind of waiting for the night to be over. So you do get tired, but you get practice with learning how to stay awake through the end of the dark sky because every minute that you can capture data with the telescope while the sky is dark and clear is incredibly valuable. It, it's, and that's something that really comes through in the book that, that there is this kind of, there is such a comp, I mean, I guess, as you say, there are, are, are very few, there are very few of these large telescopes and, and the competition to have time, it's a real privilege to be having that time and any time it's wasted, is is not just a waste to you it's it's a waste to science as a whole i guess yes we apply for access to telescopes like scientists in other fields apply for grant funding because these telescopes are such a precious resource so if you submit an application if you're lucky the committee that evaluates the applications will write back and say yes you've been given one night tonight on a telescope they'll usually give you months of warning but you're assigned a night and you go and if it's cloudy that's just it, because someone else is coming the following night. So you may have one night, two nights, three nights to do all of your research, and you want to squeeze every moment of science that you can out of that telescope. That's the sort of standard best practice in the field. But it gives you this funny sense of urgency while you're working, because you know that every moment you have at the telescope has to have as much science wrung out of it as you possibly can. But, it, but it's also kind of terrifying, because you, you mentioned weather, and, and I, I, there was a there's a there's a well-known English book from the 1970s saying it called it shouldn't happen to a vet and I, I feel like a lot of your book is like it shouldn't happen to an astronomer and weather is one of the top things and you think well okay it's a cloudy night you can't do your observing but, but you you mentioned that you know if, if that's what you need to finish your thesis and you've got you know three nights on the telescope and it's cloudy you, you're kind of you're kind of done for and so it's oh yeah can change someone's career by not having the right weather. Is that right? 
Oh, very much. Um, I have colleagues who had to delay their graduation by months or a year because the telescope was malfunctioning or there was a cloud in the wrong place in the sky. And that meant delaying, you know, moving to a new job, maybe moving to where a significant other was living. It can really have a surprisingly big impact on sort of human day to day life if you just have a cloud in the wrong place or a bad night of rain or even a bad night of wind that can keep a telescope yeah. closed. So what is what is worse, rain, wind? What 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 are what are the things that really? I mean, obviously clouds. If you can't if you can't mm -hmm. can't see, um, but but. So the worst thing for a telescope is any kind of sort of rain or snow or moisture. And I've been at observatories that have been closed for blizzards. You have to keep a telescope's dome closed when it's raining or snowing because you don't want water to get onto the big, beautiful, carefully designed mirror. I think the most frustrating weather is actually when it's windy. And I tell a story in the book of sitting through nights at a telescope where the sky was exquisitely clear. The view was amazing. We could have been getting beautiful data, but it was screamingly windy in the middle of the desert. And for the same reason, when it's that windy, telescope domes have to be kept closed because you don't want dust or sand or debris blown onto and damaging the mirror. But it's so frustrating because you see a beautiful sky and then you just everybody just starts watching the wind gauge and you cheer it on to get low enough that you can observe and it never does so that's frustrating because it's so close to being a perfect night and in terms of um i mean some of the other things that you face um okay let's go through the list earthquakes earthquakes yes yeah. chile and hawaii two of the best places for astronomy are also very earthquake prone so, so why is that why why why, why do they build build on fault lines so we build on fault lines as something of a happy accident. Um, there is a geographical connection because we like to build telescopes on the tops of tall mountains that are near sort of flat desert or flat ocean because it gives us very perfect still air. In astronomy, we want the stars to twinkle as little as possible because we want to get a nice clear photo and turbulence in the atmosphere can blur our picture. So someplace like um, Mauna Kea, the tallest mountain in Hawaii, or the foothills of the Andes in Chile are amazing places for beautiful, crisp, clear air, but they're also earthquake prone. So yes, I've talked to colleagues who have observed through earthquakes, who have seen the stars on the computer screen sort of jiggle out of view and then feel the rumble a moment later, and telescopes that have even been temporarily shut down by big earthquakes that then had to be inspected for safety. Yeah. And in terms of, um, you mentioned obviously building, um, obviously building, um, uh, building observatories on the top of the top of mountains. I mean, again, oxygen deprivation. That that's another thing that you're. I, I was kind of amazed to find that actually, uh, there's one observatory where you talk about almost having a kind of halfway. You know, you 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 stop at nine, was it nine thousand meters before you go up to fourteen thousand meters, so you don't feel ill when you get there. Yeah, the um, Mauna Kea in Hawaii has a rest station at 9,000 feet, and we sleep there to acclimatize. And then even with the acclimatization, though, when you're working at almost 14,000 feet, I've talked to colleagues who said they've taken careful notes while observing, and then they come back down to sea level and look at their notes and go, what was I thinking? This is gibberish, <laughs> because the oxygen deprivation just gets to your brain. So you're trying to do astrophysics with half your brain tied behind your back. <laughs> Okay, now here's the other one, the big one, animals. So there are yes. a lot of animals. I mean, I, I get the feeling that you probably quite like animals, but there are there are a lot of animals of one kind or in, in another in this, in this book, um, starting, with, um, starting with tarantulas. Yes. So because we're building our observatories out in kind of the middle of nowhere, we're sharing their environment with, you know, all the other creatures that live in Chile or in Hawaii. And Chile has very large tarantulas that are quite alarming when you see them. They look like, you know, every arachnophobe's nightmare. And in truth, they're completely harmless. They're very shy and scared of people. But you don't, your lizard brain doesn't remember that when you see one sitting next to your bed. So they've startled astronomers in Chile for decades now. But you're also, you're, you're also doing everything in the dark, pretty much, aren't you? I mean, you, you're... Yes. So you, you've got one, I think you tell one story of... Um, Somebody going into was that, was that a snake or was that a tarantula going in to develop his 
develop his stuff and suddenly re I and mean, then that was a cobra wasn't it snakes That's yes amazing. so this this is another uh, late colleague of mine from the university of washington paul hodge who was working with one of those photographic plates at a telescope in south africa and he went into the dark room at the end of the night to develop the plates and you have to leave a plate in the developer chemical for a very specific period of time or else you over or under develop it. And he left the dark room, opened the door to go back in because it was time to pull the plates out of the developer bath. And he saw a cobra slither through the door and just went, all right, well, if I wait for the cobra to leave, I'll lose my data and lose an entire night of work. But if I go in now, I'm locked in the dark room with the cobra. And he went in and finished developing the plates, turned on the light and the cobra was just calmly curled up next to him. And yeah, people have gotten similarly surprised by tarantulas. They've, you know, accidentally placed a hand directly on one, yeah. on a stair railing. And like, yeah, it's it's a little startling. I, I think the kind of spiders and heights and things, I, I don't think I'm cut out for this career career somehow. I, you're, you're, but, I, I, but I think it will inspire a lot of people to, 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 to go into astronomy, but they, they probably ought to have, um, probably not be scared of spiders. Bears. So we have bears. well. Let, let's start with the let's start with the brown bears. <laughs> you, yeah. You mentioned so, a... <laughs> oh yeah. So I, I forgot that there are two types of bears in here. So yeah. first of all, this is probably surprising a lot of people in general because we're talking about heights and earthquakes and tarantulas and bears. And it's one of the points I like making in the book that astronomy as a science is a little more Indiana Jones esque than you think. You think of standing next to a tripod or wearing a white lab coat, and there's a lot more adventure in this field than people realize. But the bears are another common, you know, member of the ecosystem in the mountains where we're building our observatories. And there's an observatory affiliated with my university in New Mexico that had a bear wander through a door that had been left open and just sort of stroll into the control room for one of the telescopes. And a telescope operator was alone and stepped out into the hallway. And there was a bear at the other end of the hallway having stepped in the door. And I think he and the bear were both very startled. Fortunately, they ran in opposite directions. And that was the end of that. But it, it produced a rule saying, you know, don't, don't leave the door open. I know you think we're alone on the mountain, but you'll be very surprised at the visitors that it lets in. <laughs> and I think there's a polar bear in the book even, isn't there? I think somewhere. There are. And this is, this is a very interesting aspect of astronomy too, because we've talked about telescopes built in these remote mountaintops or in these remote deserts, but we observe in an interesting number of ways. And astronomers who study, for example, a solar eclipse, don't get to wait at a telescope for a solar eclipse to be visible from that observatory. They actually bring telescopes and scientific equipment on these amazing expeditions all over the planet to wherever a solar eclipse can be seen. And I write about one of my former colleagues from the University of Hawaii, Shadia Habal, who has led amazing expeditions to study solar eclipses, her team went to Svalbard, Norway. And as part of their travel, they had to get polar bear safety training. And I know there were a few American hikers in the group going, oh yeah, you know, you make sound or you ring a bell or maybe you bring bear spray. And they said, no, we're going to train you on how to use some guns. <laughs> and we're just very matter of fact doing, you don't understand how dangerous polar bears are. So polar bear safety training was part of their astronomical observing research. I think so. Are there any are there any cute animals or are they all terrifying? Oh, there's some very cute ones. Um, in Chile, they have wild, sort of the wild equivalent of llamas and alpacas that will wander around in little families. I've seen the babies wandering with their parents sometimes. And there's a specific type of animal that almost nobody has heard of. Um, it's called a viscacha. And it looks sort of like a wise little bunny grandfather. Um, they're actually related to a chinchilla. But these animals have become fixtures at observatories. Um, they are up early in the morning and late at night. So we tend to see them as we're starting our observing runs as the sun goes down. And a cute little habit of these guys is that they like to watch sunsets. Nobody has quite figured out why, but they'll come sit on the mountain and sort of point themselves toward the setting sun. And astronomers as a species also love to watch sunsets. It's beautiful. And it gives you a sense for what the night is going to be like. So lots of astronomers have memories of watching the sun go down in Chile and sort of looking to their left. And there's these handful of little fluffy mountain residents sort of watching the sun go down with you. <laughs> well, look, um, I, I should just say that um, just in case anyone's just tuned in, we this is actually... Um, 
a big bang week event. We're not in so you haven't accidentally tuned in some kind of natural history uh, uh, <laughs> event. And we're discussing Emily Levesque's excellent book, The Last Stargazers. Um, so um, I've got a lot of other things, slightly more serious things maybe to ask you yes. in a minute, but I, I'm gonna take a, just take a question while we're here from Andy Soares, who's one of your colleagues in the profession, I believe. Um, and he asks you, do you have a favorite telescope, past or present, whether or not you've actually used it? So do, do, you, do you cover to telescope? I think that's a more interesting. So I have favorite telescopes that I've used, and I tell some of those stories in the book, so I'll leave those for readers who are going through The Last Stargazers. A favorite telescope that I never got to visit and never got to use, and I'm heartbroken, is Arecibo Observatory. So this is an enormous radio telescope, or was an enormous radio telescope in Puerto Rico. Anybody who's ever seen the movie Contact or um, the James Bond movie Goldeneye actually will be familiar with this observatory. It's designed to study radio light. So it's light that has a much longer wavelength, so a much redder color than what our eyes can see. And it's about a thousand feet across. It's built into this enormous natural depression in Puerto Rico. I can't help it. I talk about it in the present tense because <laughs> this telescope was a fixture of the field for decades. Um, the first planet that we ever discovered around another star besides our sun was discovered with Arecibo. It's done just mind blowing science. And it unfortunately underwent a tragic collapse in December of 2020. And as I wrote The Last Stargazers, I had so many colleagues tell me stories about using Arecibo Observatory, the adventures of living and working there, all the incredible science that that telescope did. And I almost visited and wasn't able to as part of my book research and said, oh, I'm sure I'll get there someday. And of course, now the telescope's collapsed and there's lots of effort in the community around possibly replacing it or rebuilding something there in its place. I hope they do. I would still love to visit the site at some point, but it was a iconic telescope and I'm heartbroken that I never got the chance to use it or go visit it. Excellent. Um, I'm going to ask you, um, in, for, for many years, I think it's fair to say that that um, uh, astronomy, observational astronomy was a particularly kind of male, thought of as a particularly male career, wrongly, obviously. Um, I mean, so much so that there was a sort of, you know, element where you know, women were not allowed into the main observatories. They weren't allowed to attend. They, some of them found ways, ways, ways around that. Um, and one of the most interesting parts of your book is, is really there's a, there's, a, there's a chapter called um, a, a Mountain of One's Own, which is a, a nod to, obviously, to Virginia Woolf, a, a room of one's own, which talks about both that sexism and also about other aspects of um, diversity and other political aspects of of of, um, of where um, uh, particularly of, of, of where observatories are, are based. Um, did you what, what what did you feel when you came to talk to your colleagues who grew up in that environment? What, what, I was I was really glad that I got the chance to talk to um, some of the women who had been at the forefront of this era when women became lead observers at telescopes. So for a long time, the rule was that, um, the rule at many observatories was that women could not be sort of given a night of telescope time. They might visit the telescope, but they couldn't stay in the dormitories on the mountain. Some of the dormitories were nicknamed the monasteries because they were men only. And of course, women still got time on these telescopes. They would get time in their husband's names or their colleagues' names. And their husbands would be given observing time when their husbands never used a telescope and these women were experts. And they stayed in other, much less comfortable accommodation on the mountain. So women fought through this and still made amazing discoveries, but it was very unfair that they had all these extra barriers put in their way that their male colleagues didn't have to do it, deal with. And I think growing up when I did, I was a kid in the 90s. So I was a kid in the era of girl power. And you hear stories about women just not being allowed to do something. And it sounds like ancient history. And my own research advisors, women who were not that much older than I was, had encountered this very directly in their careers. So it was wonderful to talk to them about how they dealt with those problems, how they have really pushed the field to change and become more inclusive and the impact that that's had now. I mean, in 2017, 
40% of the astronomy PhDs that were awarded in the United States were to women. And the field is getting closer and closer to gender equity all the time. Um, we're still not necessarily a racially inclusive field. And that is now an area that we're working on very consciously in the United States. Um, of those 40% of PhDs, 4% were to Hispanic women, 2% were to African American women. And we have an immensely diverse group of students who are so enthused about astronomy and who want to be professionals in the field. And our job now is to make the field as welcoming as we can and to encourage the people who want to do this work to join the field and stay in the field. So it's certainly improving, but it's been interesting to watch the process happen and watch it become recognized as a priority and as much a part of scientific research as the science that we're doing. It's just as important when it comes to how we learn more about the universe. It's interesting that it's clearly become a, it, it's it's a, certainly a talking point in in the profession, isn't it? I mean, later this week, we've got Chanda um, prescott Weinstein talking about her book, The Disordered Cosmos, which is which is a really striking, striking take on on, on those issues. Um, yes. I mean, obviously, we're all, um, you know, it's a big bang week. We, 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 we like the idea of, um, we like the idea of observatories. We like the idea of, of ast astronomy. But it, it is also fair to say that not everyone is keen to have a huge building built on top of on top of their mountain, on top of their land in, in, in some cases. Um, and there are two really interesting case studies that you bring up in the book. And one is one is about Mount Graham, and the other mm -hmm. one is, and forgive me, I can't remember the name of the mountain, but it is, it is in Hawaii. And can you yeah. can you tell us about that? Because I found that absolutely fascinating, this this sort of battle between or, or conversation in the best sense, but also battle between environmentalists, between astronomers, in some cases between indigenous communities. Yes. Yeah, so Ma Mount Graham in Arizona and then Mauna Kea in Hawaii are probably the two most high profile recent examples of this, although there have been others. And these are both sites where big new telescopes were proposed or were built and there was a lot of pushback and controversy against building on these mountains. And it's an interesting topic. There's a reason I devote a chunk of a, a big piece of a chapter in the book to this, because it's a very easy topic to get wrong. Um, the controversy with Mauna Kea in Hawaii is the one that's been in the news a great deal recently. And it's tend to, it tends to get summarized as Mauna Kea is seen as a sacred place and a sacred mountain in native Hawaiian religion. And it then gets reduced to, well, it's a battle between religion and science, and nothing could be further from the truth. It's a very complicated topic. Environmental concerns have historically been a part of problems with building on Mauna Kea. Um, as we, ha we have built telescopes on that mountain, and there have been very rigorous environmental standards that now need to be met as we build new things. There were simple worries about it ruining the view. It's a beautiful mountain and people didn't like the idea of putting these funny little white dots on it that you could see when you look at the mountain from all over the island. Um, it turned into a something of a symbol for indigenous land rights and what control native Hawaiians have over land that has traditionally been theirs and a place that's been their home for far longer than those of us who've lived and worked on the islands more recently. And one thing that it is not about is about telescopes. People who are objecting to these telescopes don't hate astronomy. They don't see astronomy as anti-religious. They don't see astronomy as evil. They see it as a sort of side con. It's, it's almost, the astronomy is almost pushed aside in favor of concerns about land sovereignty or about environmental impacts. And I think the frustration a lot of astronomers feel is that there really should be a way to find a middle ground to build telescopes without damaging the environment if it's done carefully and correctly, to build telescopes that don't impinge on the view and on the natural beauty of an area. Because I've been to Mauna Kea, I've been to these mountains in Arizona, they are exquisite, naturally beautiful places. And I think a lot of astronomers recognize that and don't want to literally bulldoze over it and to do it in a way that's respectful of the people that call these places home. So. I'm hoping that these conversations can continue and that the two sides can actually listen to one another. And I think understanding that it's much more than just religion versus science is a big part of getting to that point. Excellent. Um, you talk about your, 
there are hundreds of colleagues, literally, that you've, well, maybe over 100 colleagues, I think, probably, that you've spoken to in putting this book together. And you talk more generally in the book about your colleagues. Do you, how do you, what are um, astronomers like as a community? Um, <laughs> you know, is there a, is there a camar camaraderie between you? Is, 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 is that a sense, especially that sense of being alone, you know, together in a small group in a in a very particular environment there's certainly a camaraderie from shared experiences um i've had colleagues read the last stargazers and then say oh my god I've, i'm giving this book to my family members because nobody understands what it's like to do our jobs nobody understands how mad we really do get at clouds or how <laughs> tense it is to be given a night at a telescope and really want to use every second of it so the shared experience of working in this field and the shared experience of like you said finding astronomy as a calling and then sort of wrangling it into a career is something we all share. One thing that I loved about talking to so many colleagues and one thing I love about being in this field, and I think this is probably true of most people in most areas, is that astronomers are a pretty broad group. We're all unabashed geeks who love space and we all want to answer these questions about the universe so badly that we've made a career out of it. But I have colleagues that are former extremely talented ballerinas or professional athletes. I have colleagues who run ultra marathons and colleagues who are musicians. Mm -hmm. And the wide range of human interests is just as popular in astronomy as there is anywhere else. I think we probably have more um, we probably have more ultra runners than your average field. And I'm not sure why that is. I think it's, you know, an attraction okay. to solitude and <laughs> tackling a big problem a little bit at a time. But um, I actually really like that there aren't types in astronomy. And it's very tempting to imagine all of us as, you know, just intensive geeks. And we absolutely are. But I mean, I talk about this in the book when I describe um, my colleague, George Wallerstein, and he was a pilot. He was a champion boxer. He was a noted humanitarian. He had all he had this wonderful, rich, fascinating life beyond the astrophysics research that he was made famous for. So I wanted to make sure that that came across, that astronomers are people with quirks and hobbies and kids and jobs and daily work frustrations just like anybody else and and that's true true of you as well isn't it about as, as, as a musician and actually one of the metaphors that you use in the book at various points is is, is about is is about um observing collectively being like playing in an orchestra that you've got all these people coming together to, to yes know, the, the comparison that somebody gave me, which I loved, was actually um, when I was working with a really fascinating NASA observatory. So NASA has a telescope that they operate out the back of a specially modified Boeing 747 plane. So this plane flies into the stratosphere, opens a door while it's flying, and this telescope is able to observe from above most of our atmosphere. And operating an airplane and a NASA observatory is like a symphony orchestra. You have the pilots playing their part. You have mission directors playing their part, astronomers playing theirs. You have experts on the telescope and the plane and the instrument. You have safety officials. And that is like a symphony where every single person has practiced their part and together you make this incredible science. And the comparison was to working at a telescope like you described before that might be a little rickety and is in the middle of nowhere. And that was described as a bit more like a garage band where maybe there's a roadie coming in carrying a, you know, a speaker and the lead singer is also helping to tape a microphone together. And it's a little more roughshod, but you still get great music out of it in the end. So I loved that as a comparison of what different type of types of observing are like. And you've got you know, the other the other metaphor you use is you, you said that your you said that you, well, I don't know if it's a metaphor it might be true. Uh, you said that your husband said that um, because you, you always had to kind of get up and and kind of immediately go places and take two flights and then drive for two hours to get some of it. He thought you might possibly be in the CIA because it'd be the perfect cover. Yeah, he's teased. We still joke about that. And I've told him I've now put in the book, I am not a CIA operative or am I? But we have joked that it would be an exquisite cover because I've gone to really fascinating places. I, it was an unexpected benefit of being an astronomer that I got to explore my own planet. 
so much that I've gotten to go to Hawaii and Arizona and Chile. I've been to conferences on Easter Island. I've visited New Zealand and flown into the stratosphere over Antarctica. This was not what I imagined when I thought about being an astronomer. And I think if you had told sort of young Emily that this was what her job was going to be like, she would have been even more excited. Just, just coming back to this idea about the community, and and, and obviously the, there's a lot of idealism in that in that community. But but it, it, again, another really interesting chapter in here is, is is where you're talking about kind of essentially competition um, against collaboration, and it particularly comes up um, with with this thing called t um, target of targets of opportunity. Thing. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. Can you just explain a little bit about that to, to people? Because I, I think that that really kind of it really brought it to life, the kind of pressures that are coming at people from all sorts of sides. Yeah. And this also gets into why I think astronomy starts as a calling, but then gets turned into a career. So um, to explain what a target of opportunity is in astronomy, we think of the sky as really static and we think of it as fairly unchanging night after night. But there are occasional surprises or things that happen very quickly. When a star, when a very massive star reaches the end of its life and dies, it produces a supernova. And in a distant galaxy, that supernova just appears as this new little point of light. And there are advantages to observing that new light from a dying star as quickly as possible. The faster you can point a telescope at it, the more you're able to learn about the immediate death throes of that star, about its surroundings, about why it died the way it did. We have a lot we still don't understand about how a supernova works and about how stars work. So the faster you can point a telescope at that, the better it is. And telescopes will have targets of opportunity where you say, if a supernova happens in this part of the sky or a supernova happens that meets these criteria, we stop observing. If another astronomer is at the telescope, the telescope is seized from them practically and then pointed to this spot in the sky. And oftentimes with really exciting events, and I talk about a couple in the book, multiple astronomers will be trying to point at it as quickly as possible. And then they're racing because if they found something new or unusual, they want to investigate it, they want to explain the science behind it, and they want to publish and publicly release that news. And scientists are in pursuit of a good scientific answer. They're trying to answer these lovely, noble questions about where we come from in the universe, but we're also human and nobody dreams about discovering something second. <laughs> so everybody is racing to be first. And if you race too hard, the science can suffer. Um, if you race and don't collaborate and don't share data, a cool discovery can be missed when two groups collaborating would have gotten to be first together. And I think it's good to remember that scientists are human and susceptible to the idea of, oh, I can do this first, or I can have my name in the news first, discovering something new. We're as susceptible to that as anyone else. And I think admitting that and recognizing that and keeping up the work in spite of it is actually what helps make the science better. It's also a big part of our careers. There are many, many more people interested in astronomy than there are available jobs in astronomy right now. So being proactive and being the group that discovered something first or being the group that can share some new discovery can be good for the careers of the people in that research group. It can help you get a job interview. It can help you get a promotion. Yeah. And that is not the sort of corrupting factor that some people imagine. I think people imagine scientists as, you know, evilly manipulating data just to, you know, make more money. And yeah. the money involved in the field, first of all, is not is, is not the scale that people imagine. And it much more comes from the fact that we want to give our colleagues and ourselves the opportunity to discover something like this. So I think recognizing the tendency to competition and the tendency to want to be first and then realizing that you need to balance that with doing good science and doing conscientious science and collaborating, because that always makes science better, is really key to understanding how scientists tick. Absolutely. And you, you mentioned a kind of fascinating point where you, you have two groups, at one point you have two groups of scientists coming to you, two groups of astronomers coming to you saying, you've got to turn your telescope on the thing we, we want. And it's the same thing. And you're like, who do I give it to? Do I give it to the ones that I know best? Do I give it to yeah. the ones I think are going to be most efficient? It, it, yeah. it, it, it's, you know, who knew that was how it all works? 
I remember thinking that I would take the data and then not give it to either of them and say, I will share this once you agree to work together. I will share this once we all get along. <laughs> like, but, but honestly, thinking that that might be better for the science, too, if these two groups were to work together. So. Absolutely. Now, if anybody has any uh, questions uh, for Emily, please, this is your time to get them in now. Um, I've, I've got one here from Angela who says... Um, Maybe this comes back to our question about about diversity. But how easy did you find it find it to find a publisher for a book about astronomy? Oh, this is a good question. Nobody's asked me this before. Um, so I was very lucky to work with an excellent agent um, at a organization called Science Factory, and they actually specialize in getting popular science books published. And I think one thing that set the last stargazers apart because there are so many fantastic books about astronomy and about the popular science of astronomy. Neil deGrasse Tyson has written books about the science of how the universe works. Um, there are others that have come out even since my book that really delve into a scientific question. And what set the last stargazers apart was that it was about the science of astronomy. You can't not talk about the science behind how those glass plates work or why we put telescopes in the middle of nowhere. But it was also about the human stories of astronomy. It was about astronomers and this sort of behind the scenes tour through what this very unusual little field is like. And I think that human element made it appeal to a broader range of publishers than maybe otherwise would have looked at a book like this. And I was very lucky to wind up working with One World Publishing in the UK and uh, my United States publisher, Sourcebooks. And both of these are publishers that publish a wonderfully broad range of books, but who recognized that a book that combined science and the humanity behind science would be an interesting book to sort of spread to a broad audience. I I had specifically hoped that um, that this book would reach beyond the folks who would just default reach for a science book on a shelf and would get to people who didn't think of themselves as science people or who didn't think of themselves as having been good at science in school or having been good at math in school, but who liked say the movie Hidden Figures or got curious about the people who do science or liked the history of science because it takes that perspective too. So I think that helped in terms of the book having a broader appeal to publishers. Absolutely. Simon asks, um, what's the most uh, exciting discovery you've made? And I, and I should say that Emily's, Emily's specialism is is dying stars, I think, is red, red yes. giants. Yes. So I mentioned I mentioned supernovae, which are what are produced after big stars die. And I'm very interested in really massive stars, so stars that are at least 10 times as massive as our sun or more, because when stars are that massive, they live very short lives. And this is another funny thing about astronomy. Our sense of scale does get a little bit skewed because these stars live, you know, only 10 million years, as opposed to the 10 billion with a B that something like our sun would live. So these stars live relatively short lives. They die and produce a supernova. They might leave behind something like a black hole. And a specific area that I study are stars known as red supergiants. So if you're familiar with the constellation Orion, and you look in Orion's left shoulder as you stare at him, um, that left shoulder star is this bright, luminous, red, reddish looking star called Betelgeuse. And Betelgeuse is a great example of a red supergiant. So the most exciting discovery I've made is actually a strange type of star that looks from the outside like a red supergiant, but has a really unusual interior. Most stars are actually able to work and stay alive by balancing the sort of inward press of their own gravity with energy produced in their cores, basically from nuclear reactions. They fuse hydrogen into helium or helium into carbon, and that nuclear fusion generates enough energy to balance the star. So a red supergiant would look like that. Um, a, star that I discovered, which is known as a Thorne-Zhitkov object, it's named after Kip Thorne and Anna Zhitkov, who first predicted that stars like this could exist, looks like a red supergiant from the outside, but instead of its core fusing elements to generate energy, its core is actually supported by principles of quantum physics. It's so dense that the neutrons in that used to be inside atoms are getting squeezed together so tightly that they actually press back and resist that push. And 
Kip Thorne and Anna Zhitkov in the 1970s predicted that stars like this should be able to exist, even though we'd never seen a star that worked that way before. In 2014, my colleagues and I, including working with Anna Zhitkov, actually discovered a star that we think has a core like that. Because when you put such a strange core at the heart of a star, it produces these really weird chemical reactions that you see at the star's surface in terms of very strange atomic elements. So we think we've discovered the first evidence that a star like this can work. And I'm actually still actively doing research and writing research proposals and writing telescope proposals to look for more of these and answer more questions about whether we've truly found one, how these stars can work, how they evolve, how they die, how they form. And like any good scientific discovery, the discovery created more questions than it did answers. So it's been a really fun new area to study. Um, your, your book is, the book is obviously called The Last Stargazers. Um, and, um, um, and there's a reason for that, because you, and, you know, the, the subtitle is The Enduring Story of Astronomy's Vanishing Explorers. Um, one of the things that we found here is that is about, one of the things we found is, is that comes out of the book is, is about the new science being a science of AI, a science of big data. The Vera yes. Rubin telescope, um, which I think uh, launched in 2020, I think, didn't it? And it, it um, and, and, and essentially it's sucking in huge amounts of information about the Southern Hemisphere skies, which can then be sent around. You know, people can people can look at it from all over. Astronomers can can look at it from all over. Um, how is that going to change? your life how is it going to change the life of your students as they look towards having a having a career this is a this is a change that I really wanted to mark and write about in the book. So Rubin Observatory, first of all, is still under construction, but it's almost done. It should be sort of turning on and beginning to observe in the next year or two. And it's being built in Chile. And it has this beautifully simple but amazing goal. It's going to photograph the entire southern sky every few nights for 10 years. So it's going to give us this decade long movie of the night sky. And we'll be able to see every tiny thing that changes, every star that gets brighter or dimmer, every asteroid, including asteroids that might be near Earth, moving toward or away from us, every supernova that happens and then fades away. And the volume of data that this observatory produces is unreal. Um, I think I remember somebody describing the data in terms of petabytes of data. So when you work with petabytes of data, you work very differently than when you have one piece of data on a sheet of glass or when you have a few images on your laptop. And my students and I are already adjusting to this sort of big data era of astronomy where I have students who use machine learning techniques and AI algorithms to help analyze data. Um, the University of Washington is a founding partner of Rubin Observatory. And I have colleagues who take on very challenging computer science problems to try and figure out, you know, when you've discovered 100,000 new things in a night, how do you find the two that you want to follow up at a more traditional telescope? So it's technologically unbelievably exciting, but it's also very different. We won't need to go to Rubin Observatory to take these observations. We can click a button on our laptops and download the data. And we don't necessarily pour through one image at a time. We train a machine learning algorithm to analyze it. And it's interesting because it does change where astronomers are when, I, when we do our research. We're not sitting at the mountain anymore. We're not gazing directly at the sky. But it doesn't mean that we're not doing astronomy and we're not doing stargazing. It's just shifted how we apply those skills and understanding how telescopes work and how to do good observations is still key. You just sometimes wind up applying it through a computer or through an algorithm rather than with your hands at a mountaintop. And, and do you feel, does that mean some of the romance is, is, is lost? Or? Sorry, I just, I seem to have just lost your sound. So let me see if I can fix that. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me? There you go. Try asking that question again. <laughs> Can you hear me now? Um, yes. I was gonna say, does that mean that some of the romance is, is lost? I do think some of the romance does get lost when we observe this way. And part of writing the book and part of the title, The Last Stargazers, is recognizing that the way we do astronomy is changing. And it's not sort of a pining for the good old days. It's not saying, oh, I wish we did just take 
pictures on pieces of glass because the amount of science we're able to do is so good. But I did want to write down stories from this era that we're just not quite getting back. And the romance is shifting. I think the excitement of seeing something new come up on your computer screen can still be really cool, but it's not quite the same as standing on a mountain and enjoying the stargazing. Sure. Um, question from Francis. Francis says, where is the best place you have ever stargazed? Yes. So I've mentioned this a few times throughout this hour, but um, I have gotten the chance to work at a wonderful observatory in Chile, Las Campanas Observatory. And I describe in the book losing a night to wind at a telescope when the sky was perfectly clear and walking back to the dormitory in the middle of the night, sort of grumpy that I wasn't getting time on the telescope and then looking up. Um, the stargazing in a truly dark sky site and the stargazing in the Southern Hemisphere where the Milky Way is just a mind blowing sight is indescribable. If anybody gets the chance to go to a good dark sky site to observe, and in particular, if you ever get the chance to go anywhere on the Southern half of the planet, it's mind blowing. I, I can't recommend it highly enough. And, and that's technically because if you're on the Southern half of the planet, you get to see the kind of center of our galaxy really rather than the kind of outer edges. Exactly, because of the way the Earth is tilted, our southern hemisphere is pointed toward the center of the Milky Way. So seeing the galaxy from that perspective, it's much, much brighter. You're seeing the stars at the core of the Milky Way. You see the dust blocking our view of those stars. It's just, it's wonderful. Um, do you, um, uh, we're gonna have time for a cu couple more questions. Um, I've got one for you, which is is just, well, I, it's already a question. I, I just, the story of this guy, Le Gentil. Yes. Um, Le Gentil was the, astro I think this is perhaps the most tragic story I've ever heard about, certainly about astronomy, but potentially about anyone's career. He went to, he went to observe the tr uh, transit of Venus and uh, tell us what happened to him. Yes, so this was an 18th century French astronomer. Um, his last name was Le Gentil, and he was trying to observe um, Venus transiting in front of the passing in front of the sun. And much like a solar eclipse, you can't just see that from anywhere. You have to go to the specific spot on the planet where Venus will be casting a tiny little shadow as it passes in front of the sun. And he set out for India to observe the transit of Venus in 1761. And on his trip, war between France and Britain broke out. So he couldn't dock in India. And he tried to take these observations from like the deck of a ship with his telescope and it didn't work very well. He didn't get any data, but Venus transits, this moment of Venus passing in front of the sun is pretty rare. And it is this unusual phenomenon where once it happens, you'll have one transit and then eight years later, you'll see another. It's just a quirk of the orbits of our solar system. So he knew he had missed his chance in 1761, but he'd have another chance in 1769. He just decided to stick around the Indian Ocean for eight years and take another shot at the transit of Venus in 1769. By the time his opportunity came around, he was able to go to India. He was able to set up an observatory. He got ready for like a year. And then the morning of the Venus transit, it was stormy and cloudy and the chance came and went. And he had just spent eight, nine years of his life on this expedition and missed ever seeing a transit of Venus. And he'd been gone so long that, you know, he went back home, he'd been declared dead in the intervening nine years because nobody had heard from him. His family was, you know, selling off his assets. His wife had gotten remarried. <laughs> so he had basically vanished on the scientific expedition and had nothing to show for it in the end. So he wins worst observing weather story, I think, permanently, I hope permanently, in the world of astronomy. <laughs> but he's a sort of symbol for some of the frustrations, frustrations faced by you, I feel. Oh, exactly. <laughs> um, la last question, um, and this comes, comes from Anne. Um, do you think there are enough opportunities for young people to get into astronomy? And what would you say to a young person who wanted to get into astronomy? Oh, it's so, it's so hard to 
um, define the word enough there because this title of the book, The Last Stargazers, is meant to sort of recognize how the job of stargazing has changed. It's also meant as something of a challenge because plenty of people still stargaze every day. We have record setting numbers of undergraduates majoring in astronomy just at the University of Washington. And this is true of, of um, universities all over the world. We have an endless supply of young people who are passionate about astronomy and who want to contribute to it. And we're trying as a field to encourage more research funding, which directly leads to more jobs and more research opportunities. So we want to provide as many opportunities as possible for young people to enter astronomy. With something like Rubin Observatory coming online, we're going to have heaps of data for people to analyze. There's, there's a lot of universe out there and we need as many people to ask and answer questions about it as possible. So I hope we are giving young people the opportunities that they want to enter the field and then crucially to stay in the field. Jobs in astronomy are really rare and we don't want people to train for a job in the field and desperately want one just to find they can't get one because there aren't enough available. So I, I really hope that we can get as much support for astronomy as we possibly can going forward so that the young people who are interested in this can go forward. Um, I think my advice to young people who are passionate about astronomy is take physics classes, math classes, computer science classes. That's all the language of astronomy research that we use to do our research. And then try it. Major in astronomy or do an astronomy research project as an undergraduate. See what, see how you like it. And that's the best way to start exploring the field. Oh, well, thank you. That's such a, that's such a lovely optimistic point at which to end. Um, Thank you so much, Emily, for taking the time uh, to, to, to come and talk to us today. Um, Professor Emily Levesque's The Last Stargazers is available from our bookshop, lots of other bookshops, but if you... Oh, there we go. If you, if you buy it from <laughs> us, uh, it, it helps us. Um, we hope that you'll join us for other Big Bang events this week. Uh, later this evening, 7 o'clock this evening, we, uh, 7.30 this evening, we have David Chalmers, philosopher talking about his book reality plus and uh, whether the whether the uh, universe is a simulation uh, i expect we won't get a definitive answer by the end of the evening uh, but lots of people think it is um, all that really remains for me tonight is to say thank you so much to professor emily levesque uh, for kicking off big bang week 2022 and uh, good luck in your research thank you thank you so much for inviting me thanks <laughs>